Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I don't usually look this bad. Hi, I'm Des. Um, and this is a new like video series that I wanted to put together, at least for every Saturday in October, because I want to do something spooky, something fun, something filled with all the things that I love, like makeup, creepy things, Los Angeles, and drinks. So I once had this idea for this like podcast, it was called Mysteries Over Drinks, but we like just, it never really took off. It was just a whole other thing. So I decided I would turn it into a video format and it's gonna be mysteries over drinks while I get ready because um, I don't know what to do with my hands if I don't do this. So today, instead of like a nice cup of red wine, we're gonna be drinking some coffee because it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I have things to do this afternoon and we drink responsibly here. So I'm gonna bring you five different spooky stories that take place in one of my favorite places in the whole wide world, and that is Los Angeles, Hollywood, that whole area. I love it, I'm obsessed with it. And there's a lot of fun, well not fun, but you know, like creepy stories that go along with a city that old with so much history. So I'm just gonna, you know, hop right in. I'm done babbling and I'm gonna do this video because I've been trying to film it forever and I only have a little amount of time before everybody loses it. So let's just get started. Today's story is gonna be about the girl who jumped off the H of the Hollywood sign and I feel like it's a story that people know about, but it's also one of those that a lot of people just don't know about, if that makes sense. You know, it's like a story that you would know if you're really into like Hollywood ghost stories and stuff like that. So on September 16th, 1932, um, somebody jumped off the Hollywood sign. There was a woman who was taking a walk or, you know, hiking up on the Hollywood land sign. Fun fact, if you didn't know, now you know, um, before it was the Hollywood sign, it was actually called Hollywood land sign. So there's that. Um, and she was hiking up Beechwood Drive, which is, um, it's one of those roads kind of like, you know, Beverly Hills or the Hollywood Hills where a lot of famous people live. A lot of like, there's the stories where like, um, a lot of, uh, famous actresses from the time would actually like just hang out there naked, like in their houses and, you know, people could clearly see them. But anyway, that's another story for another time, I guess. Um, so... This woman was, you know, just doing her little hike up Beechwood Drive, and she comes upon this purse, and she's like, obviously when you're taking a hike, you don't assume that you're gonna find a purse, so she kind of looks through it, and um, she tries to see if she can find an identification, or just something that will tell her, like, what, why is this here? And while she's looking through it, she actually finds a suicide note and that is pretty much how the story begins and also, you know, ends. So we're going to backtrack a little bit and I'm going to tell you some background on the girl who jumped off the Hollywood H. This girl has a name, obviously. Her name is Peg Ant Whistle. Um, her real name was Millicent but they called her Meg, and um, that was, I guess, her stage name and her name to friends and family and stuff. 
girl was born in February in 1908 and she was born in England so back then she was an only child and then her mom actually passed away so when that happened her father actually moved himself and her over to New York City I guess just for like a fresh start you know like not to keep her in that environment and just to get a new outlook on life at least that's what I think um you know it doesn't really say why they moved to New York but they did and from there uh Peg's father married a new woman and together they had two boys so Peg gained some brothers and unfortunately what happened is her father actually got run over and he lost his life um, just out of nowhere so it doesn't really tell me what happened to her stepmom I'm assuming she's still it didn't say she died and it didn't say anything but the thing is is for some reason her brothers actually were sent to live with their uncle in California and the uncle was Peg's dad's brother so he lived in California and that's where her brothers went but Peg decided to stay behind she was an actress and at the time you know Broadway was really popping off it was super just it was just a, a time of thriving back then and so she actually got a couple roles on Broadway and I believe she was even in Hamlet at the time um, and the thing is is like she was a really good actress she got a lot of good reviews and fun fact um, Betty Davis was actually one of her biggest fans she had seen her in a play and she told her mom, I want to be like Peg. And so even though she wasn't like, she's not like a super famous actress and you know, people don't, it's not like a household name like Betty Davis. Betty Davis was actually one of her biggest fans growing up, which I think is a pretty cool fun fact. Um, yeah. So she was getting all these parts in the plays. A lot of the plays at the time called for like the accent and you know obviously she had the British accent going for her. So she was doing pretty well and she was doing really good reviews and she was a part of a theater company. So she was doing really well on Broadway and she was actually, um, if I look down, I'm sorry, I have to look at my notes. Um, she was actually recruited by the New York Theatre Guild and that was actually her first like credited Broadway performance in June of 1926 and she played Martha in The Man from Toronto and it ran for 28 performances so you know it was like doing pretty well and she was like in the play with quite a few different like big Broadway people um, and then in 1927, a year later, um, it's kind of like when st things start slowing down for her, but, you know, she's still a part of the theater guild, she's still getting roles, but she also marries Robert Keith. And, um, you know, it started out fine. She thought she knew who she was marrying. Is my lighting good? I don't want to look weird. So, you know, she was like, she thought she was happy. She thought everything was going great. But it turns out that Robert had some secrets and um, things that she thought he would have told her but didn't. One day they were visiting, like, his mom and she sees this picture of a little boy and she says, whose little kid is this? And his mom says, oh, well, that's... That's Robert's from his last marriage. And he's just, you know, like, he failed to tell her a pretty big part of his life, I would assume. Like, if, you know, if Matt had a child from a previous marriage, 
and he didn't tell me he was married or had children, I would probably be a little upset. But, you know, she, it's, it's upsetting and things seem kind of rocky, but she stays with him and one night they were having like a dinner party at the end, or I guess the Keith house. I don't know if she took his last name. I don't think she did or I don't know. But they're having a dinner party at their house and suddenly there's this knock on the door and she goes and opens the door and it's a cop and he is there to collect back pay for alimony for um, Robert's son, his wife, you know, I guess she was getting a little fed up that he wasn't paying the child support that needed to be paid. So she, Peg actually goes and borrows money from, you know what, I didn't do my eyebrows. Hang on, I gotta do my eyebrows. So she goes and borrows money from the theater guild in New York City, the one that she's a part of, and she's able to pay the back pay and the alimony and stuff. So she does that for him, and but they end up getting, Peg and Robert end up getting into this like heated argument, and he actually, it is like said in certain places, I don't know how true or like how accurate this is, but that he pulled out a chunk of her hair and from then on, um, she obviously wasn't going to take that, and so she got a divorce, and she was trying to go back into acting, but at the time, it was, um, you know, the start of the Great Depression, so a lot of people just weren't. I'm going to do my eyebrows, and then I'm going to come back. Give me a second. Okay, so before I was so rudely interrupted by my brows, um... Sorry, I slurped. Um, we were talking about how she got a divorce. So, in 1929, um, she got a divorce from Robert due to, you know, like, the lying of having children and, I guess, the pulling of her hair and just, like, overall things that, you know, anyone would get a divorce over. So, at this time, she's just, you know, living her life, trying to make it again on Broadway, trying to get into plays. And in September of 1929, she actually gets a role in the play of, it's called The Uninvited Guest. Um, this play doesn't do as well as her other plays. It could have been that, you know, the depression was starting and, um, you know, a lot of people just didn't have enough money to go to the shows anymore and people were moving more towards like going to the talkies or the picture shows which were just film and that was kind of when the end of the blossoming play era started um so by then she's kind of devastated it opened and she thought she was doing well but for some reason it just didn't do well they ended the show at after seven shows it just closed off broadway and oh i'm sorry about that my camera died and now we're back but moving on so she does the uninvited guest it gets cut short and um you know, it's starting to be the Depression era. People are slowly moving more towards, um, like, movies and film. My camera wasn't straight. As opposed to just, like, the typical uh, plays that everyone was going to. Also, nobody really had money to spend on plays anymore. But she goes on tour with the Theater Guild and... She's doing well. She's still getting good reviews for the one play, The Uninvited Guest. She actually was said to have given a better performance than the play called for. So, I mean, that's positive. Um, and then she comes back to New York to do her final Broadway show in 1932, which was obviously Depression era. Um, 
but this play, I have to remember what play it was, um, she made her last appearance in Alice Sit by the Fire. This one starred this. Alright, so my camera died and I just need to, I need to go. Um, so she does The Uninvited Guest. It kind of does not so well, but it's also the start of the Great Depression, so it could just be that. Um, so she's, you know, feeling a little sad about it, but she's still getting good reviews and she goes on tour with the Theater Guild, the one that she's a part of, and, um... They end up, you know, going on tour, and then she comes back to do her final show in, I'm sorry, I can't find my brush. I guess I'm not using a new brush. Um, so she goes back to Broadway to do a show, and it's called Alice Sits by the Fire. It stars Laurette Taylor, who apparently had a pretty bad alcohol problem, and that in turn causes the play to not do so well and not be able to go on because she just doesn't show up and it turns out to just be one of those issues. So Lorette just doesn't show up to the play which affects everybody and um, she ends up getting only about a week's salary which is not what she was told she was going to get paid. And at this point, it's 1932, it's the Great Depression, people are scrambling, and she thinks that maybe going out to L.A. would be a good idea, um, because she's just not doing very well in the Broadway scene anymore, and everybody's kind of moving on to film anyway, so she decides that she's moving out to Hollywood to pursue film, and, um... She moves to California and she stays with her uncle, which if you guys remember, took her brothers in. So she has family, she has like a pretty good support system. And she is just, she thinks she's gonna just be out there and she's gonna get all these like film roles. But the thing about film is, um, especially at this time, if you guys notice, a lot of the actresses kind of they all look the same which isn't a bad thing and isn't like anyone's fault but there's very little room for people to kind of break in at this point because the actresses that are already known are kind of getting all the jobs and stuff but you know it's still worth a shot I think so anyway so she went out to LA and she starts working at this theater company and she's she's doing pretty well um she actually stars in a play with the actress that was the wicked witch or the good witch in um what was that movie the wizard of oz and so you know she's doing a lot of plays with her and you know, she thinks things are going well, and they are for the most part, but she just can't seem to break into film. She actually got a film role, which was in the movie called 13 Women, and, um, you know, she had a full-on role. Like, it was a pretty good role. I'm sorry, I need a contour. Like, it was a starring role, pretty much, um, or a main role, at least. And, um, you know, she thinks she's doing pretty good for just starting out, which she pretty much is. The thing is, is as the film kind of went on, it got shelved by, I believe it was Sony or just one of those, um, production companies and nobody really knew why and her part actually ended up being cut from like a full main role to about three minutes which is like a cameo basically and that is really traumatizing and she was kind of at her wits end she 
was thinking that she was gonna make it and that she can't even make it into the movies so everything just kind of starts feeling like a downward spiral um for her and so she's even thinking about moving back to new york which that is a big move again but she's thinking about it and she thinks that maybe it would be good she could try plays again and just do that instead but the thing is she can't even like come up with the money for a train ticket back so she's feeling very disheartened and just low at this point so you can kind of see where the depression kind of sets in and just like feeling like you're not good enough no matter how hard you try so she tells her uncle on september 16th that she's gonna go meet some friends at the pharmacy so back then you know like the pharmacy was more than just like you walk in and it's a walgreens like walgreens had like milkshakes and stuff like that if you guys watch it's a wonderful life um you know the little girl kind of goes in and she meets george as he's serving her her ice cream sundae but anyway we're not talking about it's a wonderful life um and so she says that she's gonna go meet some friends she's just having a night out and her uncle obviously she's a grown person so she he's just like all right but September 16th was the day that she wasn't actually going to go meet her friends and she actually just takes a walk up along Beachwood Drive going towards the Hollywood sign. And if you've ever been at the top of the Hollywood sign, you guys know the feeling. Um, I've been up there once and it just feels like you're like the queen of the world literally it just it feels amazing you can see all the lights all the city it's just beautiful so it's kind of poetic and it's kind of just interesting the way that she went about making this decision so she walks up the beechwood drive she walks up towards the hollywood sign and you know she climbs up the h I always think of like the Lana Del Rey song every time I say that. Anyway, she climbs up the H and she jumps. The next day, a hiker, a woman, is walking up the Beechwood Drive. Just doing like a normal morning hike. And she comes across the bag, like I said at the beginning. She finds she tries to look through it and she actually finds a suicide note and the note says i'm sorry i'm afraid i'm a coward there's actual pictures of it so you guys can look it up if you want to you know like read it word for word and it had her initials on it and then after she sees the suicide note she notices the body and she calls 911 the police actually publishes the note and, um, you know, says if anybody knows who this is, could you please let us know? And her uncle, I guess he was, you know, looking for her and cause she never came back, obviously. And he recognizes the handwriting and heads straight to the police office to try and, um, you know, identify her. And it turns out, he was right, it was her, and um, you know, he obviously arranges everything, and then the next day, September 17th, or maybe like the 18th, I'm not sure, but the next day after he identified her, and they knew that she was gone, he goes to the mail, he checks the mail, and he, she gets a letter, and it says that she, this company wanted to cast her in a film or a play, I'm not sure, it depends on which article you read, but 
she won she got the leading role for this play about this woman who commits suicide which is a little creepy and just a little i don't know like everything always gets better so i mean sometimes you just have to wait it out and good things will come so you know like if she had just held out a little bit longer she could have found out that she was getting the leading role but it was too late um, she is said to haunt the Hollywood sign now. Um, the smell of her perfume, gardenias, is smelt in the air when it's cold out and there are no flowers at all, especially gardenias. There are no flowers around the Hollywood sign. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this first one. It was a little shaky because my camera's dying, but I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys next Saturday with another creepy story and another fun fall glam look so don't forget to like comment and subscribe and turn your post notifications on if you guys are want to be notified whenever i upload another one of these mystery over drinks so let me know have you guys ever been to the hollywood sign have you guys ever seen a ghost or this ghost in particular have you ever smelled gardenias while hiking at the hollywood sign let me know in the comments down below and i'll see you guys next time bye